Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light, safer than any known way. The prophet Isaiah wrote, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Good morning. A very warm welcome to Christ Church. Let us worship God. Hymn number 325. Hymn 325, Bethlehem, a noble city.
On you the Lord shines, and over you his glory will appear. Nations will journey to your light, and kings to your radiance. Let us pray. Eternal God, we worship you in your greatness in the universe we cannot comprehend. With the sun and the moon and the stars which remind us of your distance from us. And yet we recall that a star led the wise men to Bethlehem and to your son. And so we are glad that in the birth of Jesus Christ we see you stooping, guiding directing God with us. Eternal God, we confess we have not been faithful to the truth which you have revealed to us. We have seen the star, but have followed with faltering steps. We have come with the wise men and the shepherds, the great and the humble, to worship. But we have been obsessed with our worries distracted by our worldliness. In our hearts, we have tried to take hold of Christmas, and so we have not allowed Christmas to take hold of us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy Jesus, before your infant form, sages bowed the knee and acknowledged your lordship over power and wisdom. Grant us also clear vision and courage that in the light of your light, we may devote our power and potential to your service, even when that requires us to go home by another way. We ask this through that same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, boys and girls, before you come out, what's special about today? Happy New Year, by the way. First Sunday of the month is Spaghetti Sunday. A word of explanation to the visitors. On the first Sunday of each month, we encourage the congregation to bring spaghetti and sauces, which we then pass to the Salvation Army here in Bermuda. So, if you have any spaghetti, any pastas or sauces to bring, then please hold them up so that the children can bring them out. So, as you come out, boys and girls, take the pasta from anyone you see nearby. Good. Well done, Levi. You're loaded. You're loaded up. Come, we'll put them. Put them at the font as usual. We'll put them around the back. Well done. Yep, just p- put it where the stuff from the early service. Put that one down too. Manage. Just in case. Good. Take the pastor over there or have a seat here if the pastor's all there. Well done. Good, thank you. So, Happy New Year to you. Back at school? No. When's school back, Levi? Tomorrow? Next day? The grown-ups are mouthing the date with that, <laughs> with that enthusiasm that only parents can manage. So, the start of another year, 2014. Waking up, not one correction. Just from the over clever adults, it's 20. 15. Do you know what a New Year resolution is? Yeah? It's the things you try and do better than you've done in the past. You make a resolution at the beginning of this year, I am going to do 
or sometimes I'm not going to do. I'm going to do something better. Any of the grown-ups, have you heard any of the mums and dads give resolutions? Hands up if you've made a New Year resolution. You will not be asked to say what it is. I don't believe that. Thank you, Bob. I wonder what that could be. <laughs> well, I've made a resolution. I make it every year. And I've made it again. You know what? You want me to tell you what my New Year resolution is? Yeah. I'm going to try and go to bed the same day I get up. <laughs> now, is getting up the same day you go to bed the same thing? Well, I'm going to try and do that. I didn't manage it last year, or the year before, or the 37 years I've made it, actually, the truth be told. I'm going to try and go to bed the same day I get up. Do you know what that means? Yeah. yeah. Stop staying up so late. What time do you go to bed? Eight? Eight? Eight thirty? Any advance at eight thirty? <laughs> what are you doing? Ten. There we go. <gasps> you see that longing look from all the way? Ten. <laughs> well, I'm going to try and go to bed the same day I get up. Now, I'm going to try and do that and it's hard. How many people do you think, when they ask people who make resolutions, how many do you think don't keep them beyond January? They think it's 95%. Unless it's something that's really easy. It's 95%. But we try. We try our best. And we don't have to wait a year to discover whether we've done it or not. Every Sunday when we come to church in our prayer, we pray to God that he's with us, and then we say sorry for the things that, well, maybe we said things and we did things that we shouldn't have, or maybe there was things we should have done that we didn't, we missed the chance, and we say sorry to God, and we promise that we will try and be better, and God forgives us if we really promise we're going to try and do that. That's not a, we don't have to wait a year. We can do it every week, knowing that God is there to forgive us and to help us be the kind of people that he wants us to be. Not a New Year resolution. It's a Sunday resolution, knowing that God is there to hear us and to forgive us and to help us start again. So I don't know what this year will bring. I know some of the things this year will bring. But whatever the year brings, God is going to journey with us. That's why we celebrate Christmas, because God came to us in Jesus. So we don't live this life on our own. We don't make our journeys on our own. We know that he will journey with us in this new year, whatever it brings. What are you looking forward to this year? Any things that you know are happening this year? Grown-ups, anybody got passionate longings for the year that lies ahead? Summer? <laughs> well, whatever they are, whether you share them with others or whether they're private, it is our belief that God will journey with us into 2015 as he was with us in the year that's passed. Now, you'll see that today is a special day in the church. We call it the Epiphany, but it just means it's the 12th day of Christmas on Tuesday, the 6th of January. And we keep the tree up till then because in many churches in the world, today is the time that we remember the coming of the wise men. Because when you read Matthew's gospel, it says, after Jesus was born, the wise men came. We join them up for the nativity. But it's known as the epiphany. In many churches in our world, this is their Christmas. This is what they celebrate. So we like to leave all the decorations up and leave the tree up because we're still in the Christmas season. That's why we're going to sing the Calypso Carol. And while we sing it, you're going to go out to CCY, out to Sunday school. Now, just a word, if we have any visiting children with us or new to the church, if you'd like to join the boys and girls who go out for our youth program, then please just follow them out. This door on my left, you'll be made uh, most welcome to join them. You're going out. While we sing the hymn, the grown-ups will need the hymn book, the purple hymn book, and it's number 310, hymn 310, See Him Lying on a bed of straw. Hymn 310.
Please be seated. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, reading from verses 1 to 6. You can find this on page 690 in the Old Testament section of the Bible in the pews. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, reading from chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. You can find this on page 192 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory.
Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. And in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 2 in the New Testament section. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overjoyed. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down, paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word. Hymn number 323, hymn 323, The First Noel.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the 27th of November last year, while many in the congregation would be celebrating American Thanksgiving, I was in Scotland, so I was able to celebrate our son's 28th birthday with him. And on that day, we both learned of the death of Phyllis Dorothy James, Baroness James of Holland Park. You might know her better as the novelist P.D. James the great crime mystery thriller writer. She was 94. I love her books. We all love a mystery. I'm reliably told that one third of all fiction novels sold are mystery crime novels. I am addicted to Poirot and Colombo in equal measure. I never thought that my box sets of DVDs of both of them, of every episode ever made, would be so valuable until I encountered the high quality of television in Bermuda. <laughs> I have played the DVDs so much that on Christmas Eve, the DVD player died. <laughs> no more. No more Poirot. It just decided it would... Now, just in case anything happens, after the 8 o'clock service, I have been offered a new DVD. <laughs> now, that was not the point of mentioning it, but I thought I'd better mention I have another replacement, which I promise I will leave in the manse. We love a bit of mystery. It's about as much as what we don't see that incites us, as much as we do. The bits we don't know, as much as we do know. One writer said, mysteries take us into the world of the imagination, tease into play our consideration of the possibilities, coax us into thinking not only about what we see, but what we do not, what we know, and what we do not know. In a sense, they lead us to the threshold of faith, even although we're not always aware of it. The word mystery, I think, could be well applied to our reading from Ephesians and also from Matthew's gospel. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, when writing to that fledgling church at Ephesus, he actually uses the word mystery. The mystery long kept hidden has now been revealed, referring, of course, to the birth of Christ. And in Matthew's gospel, the wise men's story for Epiphany, the mystery that was following the stars by the astrologers, the mystery of their calculations and their wondering led them also to the manger. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ consider that Tuesday, which is the 12th night, the 6th of January, the epiphany, the word means the unveiling, the manifestation, the revealing of. For many of our Fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, Tuesday is their Christmas. The original celebration was Epiphany, until Christmas gobbled it up, when the church later decided on the 25th of December, which was the Roman pagan festival that they decided to add a Christian touch to. And as if they weren't satisfied with taking all the glory to December the 25th, they even pinched the wise men who now appear in our nativities when in point of fact they probably arrived later. They weren't kings. They were soothsayers. They were sages. They were the ones that would write the first century Palestinian horoscopes. They were astrologers, not astronomers. And they were fascinated by the mystery that was the universe and how they could calculate what was happening. And their mystery that was unfolding was the star would lead them to the new king of Israel. It's one of the great ironies in the Bible that these foreigners, these Gentiles, these non-Jews were led to the king of the Jews. 
when the current king of the Jews, King Herod the Great, wanted to destroy him. So the mystery is revealed. Matthew, of course, is what we call the great Jewish writer. Matthew was passionate about persuading people who were Jews that Jesus was the Messiah they were waiting for. And they would know their scriptures. The first reading that Kath read for us was from Isaiah, often quoted during Advent and Christmas. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And towards the end of the reading, there's an even bigger hint about what's to come. All the flock shall be gathered to you, and they shall bring gold and frankincense, and they shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Kings will come to your presence. They knew it was coming. They knew what they wanted. They knew what they were looking for. Would the mystery unfold in a way that would make them satisfied? Is this the Messiah? Is this what we've been waiting for? Perhaps the early Ephesian church was like so many under persecution, trying to hold on by the tips of their fingers to this thing they call faith. Some of them being called to give their life for their faith and asking the inevitable question, is this all true? Is this real? Is this God really coming among us? Is this the Messiah? Or do we wait for another? Paul says to them, it's no mystery anymore. The mystery long hidden has now been revealed that God has come among us. The mystery of the wise men and the sages of all their calculations has now led them also to the cradle. And in a funny way, although Matthew is the great Jewish gospel, by telling this story, he suddenly gives us the picture that the light was for the whole world. Humble shepherds and wise sages from the east all came to the cradle. I can still hear people bemoaning the fact that on Christmas Eve, the church is packed. They were sitting on the font. There was no seats. Plenty of seats now. And we're always bemoaning the ones that do the Christmas and Easter bit. But wasn't that like the first Christmas? Didn't the wise men come just to have a look? There's no record of them being converted. There's no record of them going to their home country and building churches and filling pews. They just wanted to see what the mystery would be. And they went home by a different route, a kind of biblical way of saying they were never the same again. Who knows what seeds are sown when someone might only come at Christmas or at Easter? And who are we to judge? Who are we to know how long it will take for the mystery to be revealed to them. When you look around the pews, you have to acknowledge we're a funny bunch. <laughs> Can you think of anything else that would draw us all together on this island apart from the mystery that is the church? P.D. James, one of my favorite writers, had a particular interest in how groups worked together, closed groups. It came from her life. Her writing came out of her life. She married an English doctor in 1941, and he had terrible experiences during the Second World War. And he was in a psychiatric institution when he came back until he died. P.D. James was 44 when her husband died. She was 50 years on her own. So to support her children, she trained as a hospital administrator in the NHS, which is how I started when I left school. She needed that work to support her children. Deeply committed Christian, a deeply active lay deacon in the Church of England, involved in so many things about worship and prayer and liturgy. So many of her crime novels, of course, have featuring the legendary Adam Dalgleish, the poet and commander of the police. P.D. James was fascinated the way these closed groups, these odd collection of people, how they function. So quite often in her novels, given her background, it features hospitals. It features schools. 
It features legal chambers with lawyers. It features theological colleges. It features churches. And for that, she was a writer who saw a mystery in what draws people together. And she always felt there was no greater mystery than the church. And so when the novels of P.D. James unfold, quite often it is a collection of people drawn together for whatever reason in the hospital or the college and who lose sight of why they are together. And it becomes self-destructive when what matters, their own views, their own desires, their own secrets, and they lose track of why they're together in the first place. And she had strong feelings about that with the church. P.D. James' view was there was no bigger, weird, strange mix of people than in the church. And what brought them together. And how self-destructive that group can be when they lose sight of why they are together. And become obsessed by the institution or their place in it. Or the future of the institution or the laws of the institution. She wrote very passionately about all of these things and often the story is resolved when people remember why they are together isn't it the mystery that draws us together every Sunday isn't it just about as much as we don't know than we do know I think the church is probably one of the most unique institutions that can draw people from such disparate backgrounds who might have nothing in common when we leave this church. But we're drawn here because we hope the mystery uncovered is true. That we hope there is more to life, as one writer said, we hope that there's more to life than work. There's more to life than taxes and money. There's something more often shrouded in mystery. But surely there's more than being born and working and dying. And I think that affects those who don't populate our pews every Sunday. There's still a deep longing within to know that there is some kind of meaning and purpose behind it all. There is some kind of mystery that is only partially revealed to us. A sense of awe and wonder. When they were making one of the great biblical epics, I think it was the greatest story ever told, the great John Wayne played the centurion at the bottom of the cross. And he had one line, surely this is the son of God. <laughs> That's all he had to say. The director said, Mr. Wayne, with all due respect, we need, as you're standing at the foot of the cross, we need more of a sense of awe. Take two, John Wayne said, oh, surely this is the son of God. <laughs> it's not quite what the director meant. And sometimes we have to recognize for those of us who are in the pew all the time, that have too many answers to too many questions that others will not be drawn to that. They need to come, whether it's infrequently, or whether it's because they've got the marks of life upon them, or when life deals them bad cards, they will come. Churches are never busier than after a disaster. The busiest the churches have ever been was immediately after 9-11. When somehow people need to be able to know there's an other that there is still a mystery, that this is not all there is. And sometimes we have to offer fewer answers and allow them to come and ask their questions because it is indeed a mystery. The mystery that has been long hidden has now been revealed in Jesus Christ. But how that mystery, how that nativity, how that child in the manger will invade all our hearts will vary from person to person. And we need to give them space and time to do that. The moderator of our General Assembly, John Chalmers, who has been in this pulpit before, 
He's been writing recently in Scotland and in the Church of Scotland magazine, Life and Work, particularly about those who come at Christmas and who come at Easter and who don't seem to come in between. The church is perhaps the greatest mystery for such an eclectic group of people who want to understand the mystery for themselves, who want to know that it is true, and want to know that what they have in their life is not all they might have. That's why it's always good to have these epiphany readings of the mystery at the beginning of a new year. We're not always sure what this new year brings. We know some of the things that this new year is going to bring, but the rest will be more of a mystery. When people used to ask my late father, what's going to happen this year? Same as last year. And he was right. And when people gave him the time to explain, he said, last year, the same as the one before. It will be a rich mixture of the things we have in our diary and the things we have in our head and the things we have in our heart and the things that are a mystery to us until they happen. But if the birth of Christ tells us anything, It is that God chose this most mysterious way of all to come among us so that whatever this year brings, we will not journey alone. The humble shepherds, the wise men from the east, from all their various descriptions and experiences of life, all ended up at the manger. so it will be for us this mystery that we call the church here in this place and throughout the world whatever life holds for us in the year that lies ahead it will be the child in the manger that ensures we do not walk alone amen your offering will now be received
Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, these gifts which now we lay before you. May we see them as tokens of our willingness to give ourselves in being your disciples. This we ask in the name of the greatest gift of all, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In extending a very warm welcome to everyone to our service, there's always a word of welcome if you're visiting us. We hope you'll have time to join us for some refreshments after the service. Going out this door on my left, just follow the congregation out. Perhaps record your visit in our visitor's book, which is in the north aisle. That's the aisle in front of me. And next to the visitor's book, there's the little um, box of prayer cards. Being the first Sunday of the month, we have a short service of Holy Communion here in the church when this service is finished. And during that service, we remember people by name. So if you would like someone remembered, please fill out one of the prayer cards. Please fill it out very carefully so we can get the name right. And if you're visiting and you'd like to fill out a card, please remember that the person that you want remembered doesn't have to have any connection with Christchurch. They don't even have to be on island. Just someone you want remembered today in our service. If you have time, then why don't you Join us for that service of Holy Communion. The Church of Scotland has an open table. We invite any member of any branch of the Christian church to share the sacrament with us. The service lasts no more than 10 minutes. There are one or two items of church news printed on your order of service, and I commend them to you. For those who can see, um, we have two flowers on the communion table this morning. Uh, for visitors, that's to say that the, represent, the flower represents the safe arrival of a baby within the fellowship of the congregation. So we have two this morning. We give thanks to God for the safe arrival of Jane Gamble Marvin on the 29th of December and Hannah May Rourke on the 30th of December. We give thanks to God for them. Thank you to those who um, gave so generously for our Christmas services, the two watch night services on Christmas Eve and the Christmas Day um, it produced about $5,900, so the three designated charities received just over $1,900, uh, our thanks. Um, we might complain about people who turn up only on Christmas Eve. You'll get no complaints from the charities. I commend the other items of church news to you. And now the session clerk, our session clerk here at Christ Church, the Mr. Doug Frith, uh, wants to say a word to you about what's happening over the next few months. Good morning. Thank you, Barry. Back in October, you'll remember that Barry said he would be preaching a sole nominee at a congregation back in Scotland. And since then, of course, he has preached. And as he has reminded us that nearly every Christmas service, this will be his and Hilda's last Christmas with us. Since then, um, the date that he will be inducted into his new congregation has been set, and the knock-on to that is that we now know he will be leaving Christchurch in February, and his last Sunday with us will be the 15th of February. A number of people have asked me, what's happening? Has a new minister been appointed? What will happen when, when Barry leaves? So I'd just like to take a few moments to answer those questions. The first thing that happens when there's an upcoming vacancy in the Church of Scotland is for Presbytery to appoint an interim moderator. And the interim moderator will be responsible for the congregation during the period of time that there is a vacancy. He'll also be responsible for providing locums if he doesn't do it himself. Well, Presbytery have appointed the Reverend Derek Lawson to be our interim moderator. He's a retired Church of Scotland minister. Uh, he and his wife have a house in France. And he is currently serving as locum to the Church of Scotland congregation in Fungarola on Costa de Sol in Spain. I have had numerous email exchanges with Derek. I'm beginning to feel like I know him quite well. His responsibilities in Fuangarola will come to an end in March, and he will be joining us towards the end of March in time for Palm Sunday. Within the Church of Scotland, congregations call their own minister, and being Presbyterian, of course, there is quite a well-defined process for that, 
and Derek will be leading us through, through that process. The first part of the process will be to elect or to confirm the electoral register of members of the congregation. Um, fundamentally, anyone who's a communicant member of Christ Church will automatically be on that, on the electoral roll. Following that, the a nominating committee will be elected, um, and that will take place in April. The nominating committee will have responsibility for preparing the advertisements, carrying out interviews, doing whatever is necessary to try and select the next minister for Christ Church will then be invited to preach to the congregation as what's known as sole nominee. Um, if I could just say something else about the electoral register, this would be a good time if anyone would like to be part of the process of choosing a minister and who is attending Christ Church but perhaps hasn't transferred their membership from another congregation, that opportunity exists uh, now between now and April. <coughs> Similarly, if you are here and are not a member of a, any congregation. I believe I'm right in saying that Barry will be organizing a new members conference in sometime in January, and there'll be an opportunity to join Christ Church by profession of faith. Uh, the final thing I'd like to say, a number of people have asked me about uh, locums. Uh, several people have said, will Stuart Lamont be able to come back? You might remember Stuart was our locum before Barry came. Um, Someone described him this morning, a very interesting character. As he arrived, he told me his role was to try and prepare the congregation for the future, to move it away from where we had been. And certainly, being a character, he did move us. Everybody loved Stuart. Someone he arrived, someone he left. But he was a character and moved us well away from the past. Similarly, people have asked if Alan Garrity, a former minister, um, could be a locum. But in keeping with the theme that we want to look forward rather than back, it would be completely against the normal policy of the Church of Scotland to have somebody who had a strong connection, such as a former minister, acting as locum. So, going back to Stuart, I should have mentioned that he actually is not available to be locum anyway. Uh, he has his own congregation in Scotland again. He did leave here to go into retirement, but he didn't seem to do too well with that. <laughs> the final thing I'd like to say, in February, Hilda will be coming back, and there will be an opportunity to formally say goodbye to Barry and Hilda in February. If anyone has any other questions, please just see me at any time. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Hymn number 326. Hymn 326, as with gladness, men of old.
Please be seated. We offer our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this new year. Through you all things are made new. At this time we ask that you forgive our faults in this past year. And so cleanse our hearts that we may start again. Refreshed and renewed to know your will and to do your work. As we stand on the threshold of another year. Encourage us by our few successes of the past. Challenge us to face with courage what this year may bring. Guide us by your eternal presence. Give us your strength in the days to come. We join with God's people in our prayers for the world. Almighty God, your angel song was peace on earth. And yet, in your children's waywardness, the peace we long for remains a dream still unfulfilled. Violence and cruelty seem to mock our Christmas music. We pray again for peace, for an end to feuds and conflicts, for reconciliation between people of different race and color, for restraint of those who would use violence to advance their cause. You guided wise men from the East, and so we pray for the wise men and women of our time. For the people of science and research, for those who apply new discoveries to daily life, for all who love the good earth and who seek to save it from waste and pollution, for those skilled in economics and finance, for all who seek to increase the harvest. We pray that the knowledge and wisdom of our time will be laid at the Christ child's feet in humble offering. Heavenly Father, we remember that for the Christ child in his nativity, there was no room. Receive to your care all who are shut out from human love and hospitality, the homeless and the lost, the victim of persecution, the sad and the lonely, the anxious and the afraid, the stranger and the captive. Receive them all to yourself, that they may know themselves at home in your love. We stand on the threshold of this year. We gaze into an unknown future. But when this year is fully upon us, when hope invites us to journey, elusive, beckoning us onward but never in our grasp, God of wisdom and promise, give us courage to travel on. When dreams glimmer in the distance, faded, clouded and hidden, or shining with new brightness, God of wisdom and promise, give us courage to travel on. When established patterns collapse, collapse into the uncertainty of the unknown, security dissolves into a memory, life is not what it was. God of wisdom and promise, give us courage to travel on. When the illusion of success threatens to divert us and silence our soul's yearning, God of wisdom and promise, give us courage to travel on. And when we think our journey has ended in the starlit glow, 
only to find the end is a new beginning. God of wisdom and promise, give us courage to travel on. And so for this year we pray peace to this house of God, where you can relax and feel at home, where the welcome goes beyond acceptance of like-minded, where doing your duty to others is part of the purpose of this place. Peace to this island, where the less privileged are empowered to be equal partners with the rest, where judgment is meted out fairly without an underlying agenda of revenge or retribution, and where the desire to heal is the spirit of the people. Peace to this world, where we progressively respect other forms of life, where conflict is addressed creatively, where burdens are shared. The harvest is for everyone. The worker deserves good pay. And in a moment of quiet in our own hearts, we offer our prayers to you, Heavenly Father, for the year that lies ahead. Lord, hear our prayers, silent and spoken, which we make in the strong, sure name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. At the end of our service, after we've sung our choral Amen, we sing Go Now in Peace. If you're visiting and you'd like to share in this, you should find the words and the music inside the back cover of your purple hymn book. Our closing hymn is number 324. Hymn 324, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
May the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine in your hearts, transform your lives, and brighten the world. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you this day and always.